Be careful. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming along to this uh, session here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome all. We'll get straight into it quite quickly. I'm Jerry Baker. I'm uh, editor at large of the Wall Street uh, Journal. Despite my accent, I actually recently became an American citizen. I've lived in the United States for 25 years. But it's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, lead the discussion here on this uh, interesting and important topic, modern supply side economics. And I think most of us, certainly most of us from an American who've lived in America for a long time, always think of supply side economics. It's the kind of, it's been the watchword of conservatives for 20, 30 years. We all think of Jack Kemp, Ronald Reagan, Jack Kemp, and Newt Gingrich, and people like Paul Ryan. And their, their conception of supply side economics was. Tax cuts, particularly tax cuts for business, capital gains, tax, in tax cuts, incentivize investment, incentivize uh, free uh, direction of uh, resources, and you get you. you <laughs> Michael, please restrain yourself, if you will. Uh, you get the idea was you increase the supply side of the economy by doing all that. But of course, in the last few years, we've had this pretty remarkable, I think it's fair to say, uh, economic uh, policy, at least transformation, in the United States, uh, led by uh, Joe Biden's administration. Um, these extraordinary measures, and again, by the way, this is, of course, this is an administration with a very, very narrow majority in the Congress. Not many people thought a lot would get done, but they passed successive major economic uh, policy measures. Michael doesn't like any of them, I'm sure, and we're going to hear a bit about that. But Jennifer, who's here, very much the author of many of them, but you just go through them, whether it was the American Rescue Plan right at the start, which obviously was help, helping to stimulate, uh, designed at least to stimulate the economy as economy was still coming out of COVID, but also contained some important uh, measures and things like education. Um, we had the investment infrastructure, the so-called Bipartisan uh, Infrastructure Act. Uh, and that was, by the way, American Rescue Plan was $2 trillion, rough, approximately. The bipartisan invest, uh, infrastructure investment was uh, half a billion dollars or so. Ten -year, these are 10-year numbers, of course, in the US. Um, the famous uh, IRA in, uh, inflation, some of us will have arguments with the naming of that uh, legislation, but it was the Inflation Reduction Act. That's its official name. Uh, major spending, of course, on green initiatives and on health care. Um, and, of course, we had the CHIPS Act, too. So all of these things have added up to trillions, trillions of dollars over 10 years. Uh, a real transformation in, in U.S. economic policy after years and years in which the left Democrats trod cautiously. None of this sort of big government, big uh, government initiatives. But that all seems to have been abandoned in the last few years. And, of course, most interestingly, it's become very much the, uh, uh, the debate is whether it's a model for the rest of the world. It's become a model to some extent because there's been a reaction to it around the world, particularly here in Europe, concerns about some of the provisions, and we'll get into this, talking about uh, whether the extent to which this is a uh, domestic-focused um, national champion, um, almost a quasi-protectionist approach. But also, um, I think many people have adopted uh, what they seem to like about much of the Biden administration's approach and think that it's the right way to go, especially in terms of some of the green investment and some of the other things. So anyway, setting the ground there, uh, we've got a, a terrific panel. I'll just quickly introduce them. You don't need much introduction, but I will quickly, briefly. Um, on my immediate left, Rachel Reeves, Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, in the UK, and obviously that means Chief Economic uh, Policy Spokesman for the, so Spokesperson for the Opposition Labour Party. Um, has been a member of Parliament since 2010, I think that's right. And we, Rachel and I do have one thing in common, which is that we both started out our working careers at the Bank of England. She obviously has gone on to considerably greater things than I, and as we look at the opinion polls in the UK, which seem to suggest that the Labour Party is on course probably this year for a majority on the scale of Tony Blair's in 1997, those things are only going to get greater for Rachel. So, Rachel, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Blake Mor Moret uh, is Chief Executive of Automation of uh, Rockwell uh, Automation, based in uh, Wisconsin, I think, Blake. You've been, right. with, uh, you've been dealing with many of these issues, and we want, want to hear from you on the kind of industrial, uh, the, the sort of the view from industry on, on, on a lot of these measures. Uh, you've been with uh, Rockwell, I think, for almost 40 years, I think I was reading. It's oh, remarkable. Wow. You've, you've, oh, wow. you've, you've obviously doing you very, very well. Uh, on his left, Michael Strain, many of you will know, uh, economist, uh, director of economic policy at the American Enterprise Institute, um, a widely written, widely published uh, author on economic policy, on broad macroeconomic policy, but also on labor and international economics. And uh, I think we'll probably be the member of the panel here with the most, shall we say, uh, 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 shall we say heterodox views uh, from <laughs> the kind of from, from the from the Davos uh, consensus. And on the far left, 
is Jennifer Harris, uh, who is now Director of Economy and Society at uh, the Economy and Society Initiative for the US at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, but who was, of course, Senior Director for International Economics at both the National Security Council and the National Economic Council uh, in the early years of the Biden administration. And so, as I said right at the start, uh, at least one of the authors of this uh, modern supply side economics. So, we've, as I say, we've got a terrific panel. Let's get straight into it. I'm going to start with you, Jennifer, since you are the, uh, the, the prime mover uh, in all of this. The whole idea behind this, and was said at the time, and again, we can talk about the individual, the individual measures, but the broad package was intended the plan it was to increase the supply side capability of the economy um, with these kind of with, with with this significant government intervention but also with things like education and child care and all the other things that uh, uh, that are associated with it and of course this major investment in green technologies obviously it's early days um, but have you seen any evidence yet that uh, you're achieving the kind of lift off of the supply side economy that, uh, that 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 you and the president claimed for it at the start Yes, I think uh, you know there's a, a, an important debate that we should have well about what the evidence should be. I think we need to kind of be thoughtful about the the arena that we construct for ourselves, the ground on which Michael and I should should fight this out. Um, but uh, you know, I think the the um, probably most uh, powerful test is is just in the basics of inflation. I think there are two foundational sort of concerns or anxieties uh, on the economic score, um, you know, keeping most of us uh, up at night. Uh, certainly for the last couple of years, that's been the acute inflation that um, you know, several of us in the White House assessed to really be a product of uh, the unwinding of the pandemic. Uh, but prior to that, and pre-existing, but never really going away, still there below the surface, we had you know, a set of concerns that a lot of us called secular stagnation that really added up to, you know, slack in the aggregate demand, a, a U.S. economy that was um, performing well below its potential, and, you know, not a lot of, of clear theories about exactly how to, how to get out of that hole. And it seemed like whether it was the longer burn secular stagnation or inflation, uh, we, we kind of put together a formula that solved for both simultaneously, which was essentially to exactly, as you said, push the productive capacity of, of the economy to the right uh, and uh, do so through a set of upstream backbone infrastructure investments in physical infrastructure, the, 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 the BIL, the technological backbone of the country and chips and science and the energy backbone. And, um, so to your question of, of how's it going, certainly we've, we saw inflation come down faster uh, with uh, you know, uh, less pain in the U.S. is something of a controlled experiment. But you're not going to ascribe that to the Inflation Reduction Act? Are not, you? not to the Inflation As Reduction opposed, Act yeah, per okay. se, but um, I do think that uh, the, uh, there, there is important um, you know, green shoots in the data that, that looks exactly like you would want it to if you wanted the story to, to play out, right? So you see the kind of hockey stick graph uh, in um, investment in uh, construction spending. You see uh, important shifts in the comp both job gains, really strong labor market that's persisted uh, as interest rates have gone up. Uh, and importantly, shifts in the composition of jobs f to uh, much higher productivity, higher value added, higher technology jobs, These are better jobs. And it's adding to the overall productivity gains that we've also seen. And, um, and so uh, there's a whole lot to like in this formula, at least as a recipe for solving what ails right now. Not for nothing, you have these co-benefits. It seems like it's a, it's a, it's a finally a politically sound approach to moving the ball on climate. And hopefully, we'll see, but kind of through doing all of these investments uh, and, and you know, places really disaggregated across the country you know, that get in away from the coasts, you uh, see people uh, believing that their government can deliver for them again and, and a reinvestment in kind of small-D democracy. Before I come to the others, do, do you accept the criticism of some in your own party that the uh, American Rescue Plan in particular, um, <laughs> with the huge um, stimulus it represented, particularly in the form of the checks that went out to, to all uh, Americans earning under a certain uh, income level, that huge stimulus, and people like Larry Summers uh, did say that he and others too thought that that believed that was extremely uh, inflationary and contributed to the inflation. So, you know, which then led obviously the Federal Reserve had to raise interest, raise interest rates. You claim the Inflation Reduction Act, isn't it a bit like, you know, 
the arsonists uh, setting fire to the house and then calling out the fire brigade to uh, to put to, to put out the fire. No, I, you know, I, I think that we have had this um, this debate about the root causes of inflation, and it, it seems like they have. Uh, you know, we see inflation come down as the, a lot of the supply chain kinks have unwound. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest this this was firmly a set of uh, supply chain related causes that are that are gone. I mean, it was a, it was a quick bout, and we're done with it. And um, you know, as a, a policymaker who's having to make policy in the fog of uh, uncertainty, you're forced to basically pick a default setting, right? Which way do you want to err? I would be, you know, knowing what we know now that that we do have the ability to. Uh, I think use a certain kind of fiscal investments that I think are disinflationary over the medium term combined with uh, the monetary policy tools that we have. Uh, it should give us comfort that in these moments of crisis, we are allowed to err on the side of, uh, of, of kind of putting a floor under the economy. And uh, so I, I would hope that uh, that's the lesson that uh, any policymaker takes from the last couple of years. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Rachel Reeves, I'll come, if I come, come to you, as I said at the beginning, a lot of interest in this from the international perspective, both its ramifications politically and, and the, the way in which it, could, it might be a model for other governments. Um, is Bidenomics the blueprint for the next Labour government? Uh, well, f first of all, just back to where you started, you know, the traditional view of supply side is that it's um, uh, policies from the right, and the traditional view of the centre-left is the sort of Keynesian pump priming, and we're now very much owning this space of uh, expanding the supply side capacity of the economy. Look, we have different constraints to the US, particularly around fiscal uh, headroom, which means that we would have to do things uh, differently if we have the privilege of forming the next government. Uh, but uh, on investment in low carbon uh, energy, for the reasons that Jennifer set out, that uh, um, it is the cheapest form of energy in the longer term will be uh, uh, de disinflationary. Uh, in addition, the need to build a more secure and resilient economy in the face of the shocks that we're facing, I call it securonomics, uh, but it is very similar to the modern supply side approach that Janet Yellen and others have set out. But in the UK, it can't just be about spending money to improve the supply side capacity. We just don't have that luxury in the UK. So for us, it is particularly around planning reforms to unlock private sector investment to improve our infrastructure in the UK. That is a big barrier to business investment in the UK right now. Uh, we are, I think, the only um, uh, G7 economy that has a lower participation rate in the uh, labour market compared with before the pandemic, we have got to get people back to work uh, by dealing with the huge backlog in our national health service and the high levels of sickness through both physical and mental health. That would be another supply side um, a policy that would make a big difference to expanding the supply side capacity of our economy and also reforms to our pension system to unlock some of the long-term patient capital. So I think our aims are similar and our diagnosis is similar of the need to build a more secure and resilient economy and address some of the supply side uh, constraints that have led to the secular stagnation that Jennifer has described, but the policy prospectus in the UK will be different. I have set out a green prosperity plan, particularly a national wealth fund to invest alongside business in some of the uh, opportunities to move us to a low carbon economy. But for me, it will be primarily the non-fiscal levers uh, to, to grow our economy and expand that supply side capacity, but very much a focus on the supply side rather than a more traditional uh, centre-left demand side the election, approach. The election will be in the next year. Will you, given that, given the fiscal constraints, are you planning to put numbers to the plans that you have ahead of the election so that people can vote on knowing what they're, what they're going to be spending? Yes, of course, and I've been very clear there will be nothing in Labour's manifesto that's not fully costed and fully funded. I've already set out a set of fiscal rules that we will pay for day-to-day -day spending. Through and is there a plan receipts. to be fiscally neutral? Or, I mean, what's the... If I'm sorry... If yeah, so the fiscal rules are that we would pay for day-to-day -day spending through tax receipts. Yeah. We would get debt down as a share of GDP. Debt has increased in 13 of the last 14 years under Conservative government. And then subject to that, we would invest in the things to boost our long-term potential as an economy. We've already set out some fiscally neutral uh, changes, to, for example, to get rid of the non-DOM tax status and replace it with a scheme for people who are genuinely in the UK for a short period of time, changes on rules around how uh, private schools are, are, are taxed, and that money will go into frontline public uh, services. But as I say, there is not going to be a lot of fiscal headroom, and all of our policies, including the commitments to get to a zero-carbon economy, will be subject 
to that tough set of fiscal rules. And before the next election, there will be at least one more budget on the 6th of March. If the election is dragged all the way into the autumn, as uh, Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, has suggested, then there is likely to be another fiscal event in the autumn of next year ahead of the election. So um, we will make the final decisions on the numbers uh, based on the inheritance that we will have. It's not the inheritance that perhaps I might have wanted, but it's the inheritance that uh, I will get if I become Chancellor in the next year. Blake, Blake Marek, give us your perspective on... Uh, from, from the private sector of the, and especially you're at the cutting edge and many of your clients I think are uh, directly involved in many of the initiatives that are in the various pieces of legislation. Give us your sense of how well it's working and, and what your expectations are since again we're in the relatively early stages of this. Sure. Well, we benefited in general from investments in America, and uh, that's uh, gone on for a while, I would say, um, you know, going back to really uh, 2016, Rockwell as a supplier of automation, hardware, and software to uh, American uh, manufacturers and production companies were probably the most pervasive technology in those plants. Um, we've seen um, large increases in revenue, in profit, uh, and uh, in our employee workforce. And I think the investments that are being made with the stimulus are, we should look first at those as investments in technologies and infrastructure that's absolutely important for America to succeed and to successfully compete in the years to come, but it's not going to be one and done. We're in the early innings um, of uh, the money actually having impact and for many of these things, such as chips and science, it's not just building the fabs, it's the whole infrastructure around the semiconductor uh, wafers uh, that's going to be required for many years for us to truly make that supply of that critical technology more resilient. Uh, Michael, come to you. You, you, you like the old supply side economics that, <laughs> that, that, that Rachel described, but uh, you know, I mean, look, obviously you, you'll want to say what you want to say about uh, about Bidenomics and what we've seen here, but it's not exactly as though that supply side uh, approach that, that you favoured, you know, we can talk a bit about the Trump tax cuts, it's not as though that exactly dramatically expanded the, the capacity of the US economy either, did it? I mean, US productivity performance has been pretty weak for quite a long time. USA, you know, relatively, we've talked about secular stagnations, the problems that the US has had. So wh wh why, 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 shouldn't we, why shouldn't we give this a try? Uh, the U.S. certainly could be doing better. Um, I don't think uh, it makes sense to characterize subsidizing economic demand and to characterize the government picking winners and losers uh, as some sort of supply-side reform. I do think some of the things President Biden has done do count. Uh, as supply-side reforms, broadband access, for example, mm -hmm. you know, will definitely help create a more educated workforce that expands the supply side of the economy. Uh, child care, properly done, helps people to work, increases the supply of labor. Um, but that does not, I think, uh, generally characterize the administration's approach to economic policy. And this is a bipartisan problem in the United States. It does not characterize President Trump's approach to economic policy. My uh, big objection to this new bipartisan approach is that it does not work. When President Trump launched his protectionist trade war, it was sold as a case of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. Everybody's gonna pay a little bit more for cans of soup as a consequence of these tariffs, we're gonna have this revitalized manufacturing sector. What actually happened? Manufacturing employment went down, not up, because inputs to production for domestic manufacturers went up and because other countries retaliated. What's going on with President Biden's uh, uh, approach to this? We're seeing an increase in construction spending. We are seeing no increase in manufacturing employment. Manufacturing employment was flat over the last 12 months. Uh, you are absolutely right about the need for an ecosystem around semiconductors. Simply, simply passing a law that gives money to build fabs in swing states in the 2024 presidential election does not create a workforce that is capable of working at those fabs. And what we're seeing is that some of those fabs are producing chips that are already obsolete. I want to give Jennifer a chance to respond because I'm sure she's shaking her head there. You disagree that manufacturing jobs are not being created? Uh, I think 
you should cite your source. Uh, my, uh, the Bureau I, of Labor Statistics. Well, uh, they, there was a there was an unfortunate Economist uh, piece that came out with that claim, and um, actually uh, some economists uh, on uh, close to the administration, but uh, really well respected from Employ America, went toe to toe with um, kind of the underlying data, and and uh, I think are, there there are. There is a retraction and a, and a correction in the works, I am told. But that, I think, it exactly reinforces my point about uh, we, are, we are breaking the mold. We are doing new things here. And we need better metrics uh, upon which to kind of have this debate so that we're not uh, you know, sort of uh, susceptible to the kind of cherry picking and the cylindra like uh, politicization of um, you know, cases that are not really representative. But, but I mean, Blake, you're, you're very much on the ground, as it were, in this. I mean, what's your perspective? What are you seeing? Are you seeing a revival of US manufacturing? And, it, and is it ascribable to, to, the, to, to all these measures? Well, uh, about 12.9 million manufacturing jobs. Uh, the data that uh, we've seen indicates that um, um, about 800,000 jobs, um, new, not necessarily new jobs in manufacturing, about three quarters of that 800,000 figure were added back uh, to uh, recover losses uh, from the pandemic. From the pandemic, um, a couple hundred thousand of new manufacturing jobs, very similar to the jobs added in 2018 that when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, were passed. So I think both of those, um, both of these um, uh, sets of measures have actually had a positive benefit on U.S. manufacturing, um, but it's going to take many years. It's not going to be a one-and-done thing uh, for either of these. I know, you know, going back to tax cuts and jobs, we repatriated money and increased our investment. Uh, a large part of that was in the U.S., and we're already seeing its early innings, but we're seeing the benefit of stimulus, um, solar panel uh, manufacturing and providing the automation for that, uh, electric vehicles and batteries. So we're seeing that, but by no means uh, are we at a point where we can uh, declare victory or total success. Jerry, if I can just quickly. Please, yeah, go on my and I, 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 No offense to your excellent company. I haven't mentioned this to you. I was an intern at Rockwell Automation wow. several decades ago. Yeah. Uh, the four-sided clock and, the, and, 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 and all that. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I uh, <laughs> didn't stick around that long. It was a summer internship. Um, I, I would question the goal of revitalizing manufacturing. It seems to be implicit in both the Republican and Democratic Party right now. It seems to be implicit in President Trump's protectionism and implicit in President Biden's approach to economic policy that revitalizing manufacturing should be the objective or an objective of economic policy. I just flatly reject that. You're quite happy to say, but, but I mean, isn't, I mean in, in an age of, um, you know, where we've seen these supply, uh, supply uh, uh, chain constraints, where we see growing geopolitical tensions, the you know relations with China, U.S. and China obviously deteriorating. This whole you know what seems to be going, and this does seem to be bipartisan. Are, is this desire for nearshoring, reshoring, all of that? Doesn't that alone argue for a revitalized U.S. These manufacturing? Are, these are all real threats. Uh, it is perfectly reasonable to argue that the United States should not rely on semiconductors produced near China, with whom we have an increasingly adversarial relationship. That. It is a huge leap to argue that they should be produced in swing states in the 2024 presidential election. They could be produced in Southeast Asia. They could be produced in Mexico. They could be produced in a variety of places. And the private sector doesn't need the White House to tell it how to manage supply chain. I want to come on to that. But can I, Jennifer Gant is, uh, I can see, I think uh, it's actually really important to um, d defend... Uh, the imp economic importance of manufacturing, uh, not as a kind of um, national security imperative, uh, but really on the straight up economic fundamentals. It's really important to have a de minimis uh, manufacturing base, uh, not so much for what you are producing today, but for the ability to innovate tomorrow. Uh, electric EV batteries. Uh, the, the U.S. kind of invented sodium ion technology. Uh, we went to the different direction with lithium. Uh, right now, uh, you know, China is uh, outfitting all of its EV manufacturing, not all, but a lot of its EV manufacturing, battery manufacturing base to run on sodium because of advances that have happened in sodium. We have to now build an EV manufacturer, battery manufacturing base and, and before we get to the question of, of you know, figuring out sodium and reverse engineering those, that wouldn't be the case if we had some de minimis manufacturing base. So it really is about the innovation clusters uh, and the 
the, the distributed geographies uh, that, um, that a manufacturing base uh, allows for an economy. I want to move on. I know you'll, you'll want to respond, Michael, but I want to move on. Rachel, I particularly want to come to you. And, and um, you know, this is all dressed up as modern. You just, as you well described, did a kind of in, you know, swapping clothes between the Keynesians and, and the kind of uh, supply siders, with this now being, you know, supply side now being the kind of the, 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 the progressive uh, view. Some of us are old enough to remember industrial policy. Um, and it does sound quite a lot like industrial policy, what Michael calls government picking winners. I actually, literally, I'm old enough to just about to remember uh, the Labour government of the 1960s and 1970s. It didn't end well, did it? Um, government, you know, d uh, directing investment into particular areas. And in fact, the whole revival of um, the, sort of the Western, if you like, you know, the, the, what people now call the, the, the neoliberal consensus, but the whole revival of, 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 Western, of the Western economy that took place with the liberalization and government getting out of that occurred pre precisely because of that. This just sounds a bit like you want to take us back to the glory days of um, so, Tony Benn. So I think it's, it's a myth that there's not an industrial strategy today. There is always an industrial strategy, whether it's written down or not. And the industrial strategy today of the government is a you know, laissez-faire, leave it to themselves uh, strategy. Uh, we're not in the business of picking winners and picking firms to back, but there are sectors of the economy where Britain does have huge strengths, uh, life sciences, creative industries, professional services, and in some of the clean energy industries of the future, particularly carbon capture, uh, green hydrogen, and, and floating offshore wind because of our industrial heritage and our climate and, uh, and, and, and other strengths that we have. And in a transition, which is what we will be going through in, uh, in, in, in energy, there is a role for government to partner with businesses, but also with universities to make the most of the resources and the potential that we've got. And there is a global race on for these jobs and this investment. And if the industrial strategy is get out of the way and just leave it to the market, then I can tell you the jobs and the investment won't be coming to Britain. They will be going elsewhere to countries that have got a more active uh, industrial strategy. So um, we are proud that we are going into the election with an offer of an industrial strategy uh, and an industrial strategy council on a statutory uh, footing, actually borrowing from some of the better ideas that the Conservatives had had over the last 14 years. When Greg Clark was the Secretary of State for uh, Business, uh, he did um, uh, pull together an industrial strategy Strategy. And Andy Haldane, the former um, uh, chief economist at the Bank of England, was uh, chairing that industrial strategy council. That was ditched. I think there's been something like 11 growth plans um, in the 14 years of this Conservative uh, government. Uh, we want to have one that lasts to give businesses. And I think this is a key part of the approach of an incoming Labour government pro-business, pro-wealth creation, and working with business to identify the things that are currently blocking investment. And as I say, this is certainly not about just throwing money at a problem. This is about reforming our planning system so that private sector investment, there's at the moment 200 billion pounds worth of projects stuck in the pipeline to trying to get a connection to our national grid uh, system. We want to unlock that private sector investment in the economy and through the creation of a national wealth fund, leverage in private sector investment in some of those new exciting technologies from carbon capture to small modular reactors to green hydrogen and floating offshore wind where Britain has huge potential but we'll miss out on it uh, unless government so plays a more active role. So this is not sort of National Enterprise Board revisited? Or, uh, no, a, 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 absolutely not. This is a modern uh, approach. It is a, a different approach. Uh, but I think it is also distinct from the approach that you see in the US, in, in part because of the resources and the constraints that a Labour government would inherit. Actually getting people back to work would probably be the quickest thing you could do to boost the supply side capacity of the UK. But when you've got a NHS waiting list of 7.8 million you can see that there are a lot of people who are not available for work today so our modern supply side approach is beyond uh, an industrial strategy it's looking at the other things that are holding us back and constraining the supply side um, of our economy Blake I think you you think that actually there are benefits from if you like from both from both the old supply side economics uh, and the modern supply side economics we were just talk, talking a little bit earlier about um, you know obviously Donald you know we 
we had the big Donald Trump uh, tax cuts, which cut particularly mm. corporate taxes uh, by a significant amount. You and you know there are some going continuing arguments among economists about whether they were effective in terms of improving, uh, increasing investment. Or but you 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 were, you, you, you you viewed that quite positively, and you think that has helped as well to to energize the U.S. economy, don't you? I do, and I think further to that, I I do think there's a very strong case uh, for having as an explicit goal the increase of manufacturing in the U.S. Now, it's not all manufacturing. It's manufacturing that we can compete and win in, which means that it's a combination of the technology and the labor. Even if those labor rates are high compared to the average in the world, we've proven uh, and our customers have proven that the combination together, you can compete. So I think the inference that we should you know, give up manufacturing as a part of the economy would be a disaster. Not only the jobs directly employed in manufacturing, but the multiplier effect, the capital formation that's affected, other services that are affected is absolutely essential. And we see that companies, even with the higher wage rates in the U.S., can compete and win in manufacturing areas where both are important. Let's, I, want to talk, I want to come to questions. We've not got too much time left, so, but I want, want to look at the international implications of this. Obviously, we, we're, we're here in Davos, and we're looking at the global um, economic implications of this. And, I, and again, I want, I want you all to I want to get all your views on this. Uh, Jennifer, I'll start with you. Obviously, obviously, the, the, the you know the big concern, whatever one's views are, other otherwise of the merits either of you know boosting manufacturing. Michael doesn't like that, but but sort of doing it in this way, and a lot of you know people on the right uh, in the United States and indeed around the world don't like that. But whatever the, the specific merits, uh, there's a lot of concern that this represented um, yet another kind of blow to, to, in the direction of deglobalization, de that it was about you know, America favoring, privileging uh, American companies. Uh, it it, it sell, sent, I remember being here in Davos two years ago, I think, when, just not long after it had passed, when Joe Manchin was here and was getting, a, getting his, his ear bent by European uh, officials telling him, you know, this is, a, this is basically protect, this is, this is, this is protectionism. This is a, a thinly disguised protectionism, um, you know, and it's going to lead to, uh, you know, increased, uh, you know, increased focus around the world subsidies uh, increase in you know, all contrary to the to principles of free trade and everything else how do you respond to that and it, i mean you know and again i know there were some concessions were made but but the you know made in america provisions the america first uh, a broad approach to this with the chips act with the ira it does look like this is um this is a this is this this this, this is a domestically focused um uh sort of raised middle finger to the rest of the world um no surprise. Uh, I, I would take another view. Um, maybe uh, two or three points. One, uh, the I think probably the largest uh, dividend internationally from at least the IRA, which is what I know best, is just the technological spillover and the way that uh, this R&D and learning will push cost curves down uh, across the board, especially for some of the more you know, nascent technology and areas like hydrogen and carbon management. But uh, the best estimates I've seen are from Rhodium suggesting that uh, across the board, you're looking at a 10 to 15% uh, reduction in uh, the cost of clean energy technologies, which looks a lot like the role that Germany played for solar in the 90s, thing one. Thing two, uh, you know, this is adding to aggregate demand at a time when China is slowing, when the world needs sources of aggregate demand. I think it is uh, fair and, and um, you know, uh, right to uh, expect the U.S. taxpayer to, if they're footing that bill, to be first in line for these investments, especially when uh, Joe Manchin has made quite clear that it was it was essential to getting them over the line. And then I think the response uh, from the U.S. and I'm, I'm thinking mostly of the, the the speech that I worked with uh, Jake Sullivan on as kind of my my parting gesture out out the door in the administration this past spring. Uh, the, uh, the posture of the U.S. has been do it too, not in a glib way. Uh, we want you to do it, we need you to do it. In fact, we can't reach the domestic goals that we have set out for ourselves without the U.S.'s partners, uh, you know, doing something uh, of the sort, whether it's securonomics in the U.K., I think, you know, there will be local context and flavor. But uh, by and large, you know, the, the kind of leave it to the market 
uh, you know, approach of this energy transition. We've tried that for 40 years, and it's gotten us nowhere. We don't have time uh, to to kind of you know run that experiment again. And so, you know, we need to take a more hands-on approach. It's going to look different everywhere. But uh, I think what the U.S. has said, and now we need to help it follow through, uh, is that, uh, you know, at least the Biden administration, they will overhaul a lot of the U.S. foreign policy into making the U.S. a more affirmative partner in helping other countries do it, too. There's $3 trillion that we need to see, you know, materialize, get in the game um, uh, in the clean energy transition. We've just passed the $1 trillion mark. That is more than enough opportunity there. Uh, for everybody. Michael, your view? I mean, is, there does seem to be a bipartisan consensus, whatever, again, one thinks of the specific measures, there's kind of a bipartisan consensus, at least as far as the Trump side of the Republican Party is concerned towards America first. Um, do you think this fits into that kind of broad, what could be described as sort of protectionist approach? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think it's very hard to distinguish between the two to the point that President Biden, despite many uh, uh, expectations, kept in place the Trump tariffs despite the fact that taking the Trump tariffs down would have reduced inflation, which the president said was his, his number one goal. Just to be clear, I don't think the U.S. should not have a manufacturing sector. I think the, I think the manufacturing sector in the U.S. is vital and important, and I think exactly for the reasons that you say it is. Uh, and there's a reason why manufacturing employees in the United States earn so much more than abroad. My objection is to dumping hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars onto that sector, uh, rather than just treating that sector neutrally along with all other sectors in the economy. Uh, I think there's no question but that the Inflation Reduction Act has been a major geopolitical problem. If I recall correctly, President Macron uh, said that it threatened to fragment the West. And what you get is a subsidy war where we subsidize, they subsidize, we do some carve-outs here and there, they do some carve-outs here and there, and, and, and when subsidies are countered with other subsidies, they're not effective. And so all we're doing is lighting taxpayer money on fire. If you want to have advances in innovation in clean tech, do a carbon tax. It'll raise revenue, which is what we need. It is neutral as to which technologies it supports. You don't have the White House and the United States Senate deciding uh, who gets IRA subsidies. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have markets deciding. That will produce better outcomes. There's a state capacity issue here. The, the United States government is having a hard time getting the money out the door. Child care centers have to be built within 50 miles of fabs. All these competing goals, even if, the, even if the, the law were perfectly designed, which of course it isn't, there are real questions as to whether or not the government can actually make this sort of thing work. Blake, your, um, your perspective from a major U.S. company with major, US, uh, with major international operations, is this, uh, how do you see it? Is this, a, is this going to um, focus more of your attention and resources and, you know, uh, on the U.S. Well, it already has, uh, as you know, the um, as as the share leader um, and the amount of demand that's being placed on us, uh, we're definitely seeing uh, increased emphasis um, because of the actual activity, and also because obviously our European competitors see it as an you know an opportunity as well, uh, and and so uh, they're certainly competing uh, uh, for this, and uh, we expect to. Uh, you know, uh, win more than our fair share, quite frankly, and so we're making additional investment. I think that it's a starting point. Uh, these are these are multi-year, uh, multi-multi-year um, uh, propositions, uh, particularly semiconductor. You know, the transition in the automotive industry as we look at you know bringing up renewable forms of energy. Um, and, the, and the grid to be able to do that, we're going to have to have heart and it's going to have to survive, you know, multiple administrations for this to have the kind of long-term impact uh, that was originally uh, intended. Rachel, is this a consideration for you? As a Labour government, you're going to be having important conversations with partners, um, obviously in the EU, but around the world about uh, and looking for, you know, trade, you know, uh, closer trading opportunities. Is this going to be something that's going to help that or be an impediment to that? What's your, where do you stand on this? Well, uh, I, I strongly agree with what Jennifer said um, at the beginning. And I sort of, like, Michael's position is sort of, if we just sort of carried on like we were, everything would be fine. But everything wasn't fine. Economies weren't really growing. Uh, and inequalities were uh, widening. And we were losing more jobs to 
uh, and, and, and exposing vulnerabilities by relying too much on countries that don't share our values. So we have to do something differently. I'm not suggesting, I don't think Jennifer is either, that everything has been done correctly uh, and you know, with the benefit of hindsight maybe you do some things differently. But I think we have got to try something different. And I think the last few years ha have shown us that these sort of once in a generation or once in a hundred year pandemic, war, um, uh, uh, etc., these things are coming at us thick and fast and they are exposing vulnerabilities in both our economies and many other developed economies alike that the the model of the fastest and the cheapest and the quickest and it doesn't matter who owns things and where they're made I think those days are gone because those do those things do matter and the vulnerabilities in our economies have been exposed by a model that I think has passed its sell-by date. Uh, now, I, that certainly doesn't mean trying to do everything yourself and for a small open economy like the UK, it can't possibly mean trying to do everything for ourselves. But it does mean trying to build a bit more resilience into our economy. So when shocks come along, Britain is not as exposed as it has been. You know, our inflation rose the fastest. Our economy uh, um, has struggled uh, the most to bounce back. And a lot of that has been because of a lack of resilience and too much exposure to these global uh, events. And we have got to build the supply side capacity, get more people into uh, work, more good jobs in parts of the country that uh, haven't been benefited um, in the last 40 uh, years uh, and that means trying something different. You might not always get everything uh, right but if we carry on like this we're going to find uh, British growth uh, stuck in the slow lane whilst other countries seize the opportunities in a whole range of industries. Um, but I would just go back to the point that in the UK the approach will be different from the US but the same philosophy that boosting supply side capacity uh, is the way to uh, achieve strong and sustainable growth in the future. Thank you. We've got a, just a couple of minutes for a couple of questions from the floor. Please. Yes, ma'am. No, there's a mic coming. Uh, Mehreen Khan from the Times of London. Um, uh, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. I'll still shout. Yeah, but can you hear it? Oh, you can hear it. Now. Sorry. Uh, Mehreen Khan from the Times of London. Uh, one issue that hasn't been mentioned is how to expand the supply of labour. And I know that, Rachel, you mentioned it a little bit when talking about labour force participation. But migration is an obvious way that rich countries have expanded the, ex the, the supply of their labour. It hasn't been mentioned. And I'm wondering from Jen and maybe from you, Rachel, whether there's a tacit feeling that Western democracies can't actually handle increases in migration and when we think about supply side economics we're just going to ignore this because it's too uh, politically or culturally sensitive for us to really tackle head on from an economic perspective. Rachel, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, thanks very much, um, Marine. I think that we have got to help support people who are already in the UK economy take on the jobs that are available. Uh, there are uh, many vacancies unfilled. There are huge skills gaps in a whole range of areas. And we can't just turn to the short-term fix of importing more labour. We've got many people out of work because of long-term uh, sickness. I think the, uh, the, the additional cost uh, in terms of higher benefit payments and lower tax revenues is something in the tune of £15 billion uh, since the pandemic uh, because of fewer people, um, more people claiming those sickness benefits. So we've got to help people back into the labour market and ensure that people are being trained up with the skills that are needed. You've got this disconnect in the UK today where you've got the um, Migration Advisory Council who recommend uh, on the need to bring in migrant labour, but that doesn't feed back into our skills and further education policy of what young people and others need to be learning to fix those skill gaps. So if we have a lack of people available to work in as data scientists or in social care, what are we actually doing to train people up who are already uh, in the UK? And, and that would be my uh, response, both helping people get back into work and ensuring they've got the skills. Subject to that, of course, where we've got skills gaps, uh, we do need to use migration. And I think migration has been of huge benefit uh, to the UK over a long period of time, uh, not least attracting uh, high-skilled people to our fantastic universities and then encouraging them to contribute uh, in our labour market. But immigration cannot be the answer to all our skills problems. We've got to do more to help people who are already here uh, skill up and get the jobs that are available in the economy. 
I don't know if anyone else wants to comment sure. on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Blake. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think uh, uh, in the U.S. to frame the problem, we have several hundred thousand unfilled in, uh, manufacturing jobs today and expected to grow over the coming years to a couple of million of those. Immigration reform is a part of it. Reskilling and upskilling uh, employees uh, throughout their career in quick hit programs to be able to give them the skills to be able to thrive uh, in the jobs interacting with technology is an absolutely fundamental part of this as well. And I will say it some of the new technologies, including AI, hold the promise to simplify tasks and so that people through their career can actually look and compete successfully for new jobs in these manufacturing areas. We may have time for, if there's anyone's one more, any quick question? We may just about running out of time. No, in that I case. I can answer the oh, last one. Yeah, Michael, go on, why don't you, and I'll give Jennifer a chance too. So you've got uh, to, you. In addition to, to immigration, which I think is vitally important, and I agree with everything you said, including about AI, we have a great program in the United States uh, called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is an earning subsidy. Uh, if you work and you earn $10,000 a year and you have a couple of kids, then the government will give you $4,000 on top of that. That has been demonstrated to increase workforce participation. It's a redistributionist policy, but I think it is a true supply side policy because it increases the supply of labor. It has had broad bipartisan consensus in the United States, but the consensus for it under President Trump seemed to kind of evaporate, and President Biden hasn't chosen to champion it. Jennifer, last word, either on this immigration question or since you're the last, you've got the opportunity to wrap it all up on modern supply side economics. Thank you. Um, uh, not, not to leave us with the downer, but I, I'll just leave you with kind of what's keeping me up at night. Um, I, I do agree that there's a lot to the how, and this is new, and there's you know a lot of humility and learning, and uh, you know some of the most dedicated, hardest working people I know are are figuring it out and sweating the details every day. Um, it's actually interest rates uh, for the um, the investments that we're talking about, especially within the IRA. Although I think it's somewhat fair of, of chips and science as well. These are incredibly capital intensive. And, uh, and, and again, I think disinflationary over the medium and longer term. And to have um, rates now that inflation, I think, is, is um, firmly settled, um, lingering at 5.5%, I just don't see any justification. Uh, and it's, it's a really dangerous headwind, I think, when you're looking at uh, you know, the difference between a new clean energy investment and a high interest rate environment versus a, a gas plant. That it's going to increase gas plant costs something like 8%, and that's going to increase the clean energy investment something like 50%. Uh, so every day matters, and I think that we need to see the Fed cut 300 basis points before they start asking questions. And uh, you know, not for nothing, but I think there are, are important, you know, um, you know, political and other uh, consequences that that go along with the Fed sort of doing its job of respecting its dual mandate. All right, it's cocktail hour, I think, and I can hear the sound of bottles being opened all over uh, Davos. So uh, we should let you go at this point, but I just want to say it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Certainly learned a lot about uh, new uh, supply-side economics, new and old, and uh, all of its uh, opportunities and risks and everything else that it represents. And it's been a wonderful panel. Please join me in thanking our panel for this conversation. <laughs>